I'm Shelby Williams with Plano City Council, and we thought this was going to be the last council meeting of the year, but we're actually going to have a special meeting Thursday afternoon to discuss uh, CARES Act funding. But at the penultimate meeting, uh, first I want to say that last Saturday, uh, City Council took turns from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. at uh, a couple of locations in Central Plano, ringing the bell for the Salvation Army. Uh, combined, we raised about $6,800. Uh, both through online fundraisers and uh, in the kettles, ringing the bell. And we had a little friendly competition amongst council. Um, I did not rig it this way, even though I organized it. Uh, I ended up winning, but I can't claim credit because toward the end of my shift, a uh, friend stopped by and turned out, I didn't even know it at the time, uh, contributed uh, a very large sum. So uh, many thanks to uh, John and Denise Stuffelbeam for their generous contribution, which put me over the top to uh, win this friendly competition. But the real winners, of course, are those whom the Salvation Army helps. Um, moving into the preliminary open meeting tonight, we uh, heard the DART report. So in the first month of FY21, that's October 1st through 31st, um, for one month in Plano, we saw 35,000 um, bus rides. A ride is every time a person gets on. Um, uh, that's a lot less for the bus than in Garland, Richardson, and Irving. Obviously, Dallas is going to have more. Uh, we had 50,000 light rail rides. Um, again, that's every time somebody steps on. Um, that is a, uh, a lot more than in those other areas, um, Garland, Richardson, and Irving. We have a lot more ridership for the light rail in Plano. And 2,300 GoLink rides, that's uh, pri primarily in West Plano. Um, uh, which is very different. That's way, way more than anywhere else, primarily because we're set up specifically for GoLink um, and it's uh, more conducive in Plano than at other places currently. We then had a review of the proposed bond referendum projects. Uh, last time we reviewed parks and recreation, this time we reviewed facilities. Um, there is a total of $44.1 million in proposed bond funding uh, for facilities. Uh, going down the list, we've got $9 million for renovation of fire station number five, $12 million for renovation of fire station number eight, uh, $5 million for parking canopies. This was something I asked a question about. Uh, <clears throat> what precipitated this, what was given in the justification, was that three years ago in 2017, we incurred, I think it was $1.8 million worth of hail damage uh, in a hailstorm. So why are we spending $5 million to prevent uh, 1.8 million three years ago, or every, call it every three years? <clears throat> and it's not entirely a financial matter. Uh, it turns out that a number of vehicles, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to find out the number of this, they're gonna get back to me, the actual proportion of vehicles that were damaged had their uh, windshields uh, damaged. So when it comes to public safety vehicles, you know, a squad car could ride around with some hail damage, but if the windshield is damaged, that is a functional disability for that vehicle, which puts it out of service uh, because it's not safe for public safety. <clears throat> so um, pending the uh, response to that, that would actually be a, um, a vet pretty valid reason to invest in the parking camp and canopies to make sure that uh, we had sufficient amount of the fleet that remained uh, usable after a severe weather event. Uh, next is fueling stations. It's a, a fueling station at $6.2 million. The idea is that the run on fuel after Hurricane Harvey um, put us in a, a bit of a shortage. And if there were such an event that happened again, we wanna make sure that we have sufficient reserves and are able to fuel uh, at least our public safety vehicles and those supporting public safety. So I did ask whether we might uh, more efficiently and viably stockpile just actual fuel rather than building a whole filling, filling station uh, or partner with a local uh, fuel provider uh, to just guarantee us some reserves in event of, uh, uh, of such, such a disaster. Uh, so we'll check on that and we'll see what they come back with. Um, 3.5 million for various roof replacements, uh, five and a half million for council chamber renovations. Uh, <clears throat> Mayor Harry uh, joked that most of that was going to go toward uh, Mayor uh, Pro Tem Prince's uh, seat uh, for the throne that she's gonna get on the dais. Uh, but actually it's going toward uh, Americans with Disability Act updates. Uh, this council chamber was built before the ADA, um, <clears throat> so it requires some updates. Uh, there's an acoustic problem here that you might be able to hear through this video and an update of the audio system that totals 5.5 million dollars 
and we're going to get lazy boys around the council dais. I'm joking, not really. Uh, Two million dollars for various renovations and repairs around the city. Um, uh, 190,000 for the Schimmelfennig parking lot replacement. Uh, they showed some pictures, it's in pretty sad shape. Uh, $460,000 for fire station doors and uh, floor uh, replacement. $475,000 for locker room and restroom renovation. $500,000 for a Haggard Library window replacements uh, on the north side. Uh, $300,000 for the Robinson Justice Center elevator jack. Uh, issues with the elevator. It's Jack. Have a good night. <laughs> Have a good night, Shelby. Uh, various LED parking lamps and poles uh, for 400 replacement for $430,000 and feasibility studies for future projects totaling $500,000. I'm going to have to dig in and see uh, what all that entails. Um, then we move to our regular meeting. Several people spoke in the comments of public interest about Montessori Children's House. Um, and. Uh, the city attorney, this has been an ongoing uh, litigation for five years, I think it was, well before my time on council. And the city attorney raised an interesting prospect of the council, if it so agrees, waiving attorney-client privilege to disclose details of prior offers and how this has gone in public meeting. <clears throat> Part of the challenge is that uh, a lot has gone on in executive session because it involves litigation. The Texas Open Meetings Act provides for specific um, reasons why it's where it's legitimate to go into executive session away from the public eye uh, litigation pending litigation involving the city is one of those reasons and so since this has been such an ongoing issue we discuss all this in executive session so I know what's going on but I can't share it with anybody so when people are coming to me with frustrations why is this happening why is that happening I can't really say anything so if the council were to waive that attorney-client privilege and air all this in the open I think that would cut through a lot of the clutter. Uh, next, we discussed the sale of uh, 2.4 acres of land to the city uh, just north of 15th Street between M and N Avenue. This is the uh, vacant land uh, just on the other side of 15th from the old First Baptist Church. Um, the nearest park parks are Haggard and at Mendenhall Elementary, both of which are about a third of a mile away. Um, the city would lease back the land until the new church is complete, the new First Baptist Church is complete. Um, would that be the Second Baptist Church? I digress. Um, the, the proposed sale price was about $1.8 million. The last appraisal came in at $1.5 million. So we were looking at um, uh, a sale price of $17.5 per square foot. Um, we discussed tabling this item uh, pending an update of the appraisal, which was estimated to cost between one and three thousand uh, dollars. But it didn't look like it was getting enough support for tabling, so we ultimately made the motion to deny. The denial passed five to two, so uh, uh, that was denied. The city is not going to uh, purchase that land for that purchase price. It's entirely possible that uh, negotiations could start over again and a new offer could be made. We'll have to see. Um, there was a consent agenda item that was actually tied with that developer uh, in town homes. Uh, so that was put on the regular agenda and then um, that did not pass five to two because it was the same vote because it was all tied up together uh, with the same property and same developer. Um, Moving on to the renovation of Oak Point Park outdoor pool uh, for a price tag of the princely sum of $9.4 million. Now, this amount was approved by voters in 2017 in the bond referendum for the pool, and it was approved by us for the CIP budget um, for this year uh, earlier. Uh, so this is uh, going to completely renovate the outdoor pool at Oak Point Center and put in a double-ended wave pool uh, with some additional play features. That passed seven to zero. Uh, Council Member Grady was out tonight, uh, as I requested last week in my video recap. Um, I don't know how much of this is public, but please pray for uh, Council Member Grady and his family. Uh, uh, third, um, we adopted standards of care for the parks and recreation classes. Uh, <clears throat> what this does is uh, parks and rec classes under state statute are considered a daycare. 
but there is an exemption uh, for municipalities that offer these programs so that we don't actually have to apply for daycare licensing. So by showing uh, that we have specific standards of care for these programs and these classes and formally adopting them through council, we are able, we are able to request a waiver of the licensing requirement. That passed seven to zero because we offer outstanding care. Uh, <clears throat> then we moved on to um, a zoning request, which was essentially just swapping out a, um, a daycare specific use permit, SUP, for a private school. SUP. Now, much like the Archgate Montessori um, uh, case of last year that uh, caused so much contention, uh, this had also uh, been operating as a private school since 2012 um, for the past eight years. <clears throat> However, um, it was classified as a parochial school. This is for Coram Deo Christian Academy. Uh, so it had been classified as a parochial school back then and did not require an SUP. Things have changed since then, and so under uh, new requirements, um, they came, they were uh, interacting with the city, and the city told them, well, you need an SUP for this now. Uh, so they applied for the SUP. Uh, they're already in operation. They basically just got the SUP to uh, formalize what they're already doing. Um, so that passed 7-0 to zero as well. Um, then we got to uh, probably the lengthiest um, item tonight, but uh, I'll skip to the punchline. It passed 7-0. This was the rezoning for the Plano Market Square Mall, uh, the antique mall. Uh, this is off of uh, K Avenue and Spring Creek Parkway. Um, it was the, the Plano Market Square Mall, is, there's no other way to put it, is blighted. Uh, for most of my time in Plano, my wife and I, we live right around the corner from there. We've been in that property several times and it is in dire need of renovation and revitalization. So the proposed, uh, or past, I'll say, because I skipped to the punchline already, the past zoning request was for office, a little bit of retail, and some multifamily. There's also a row of townhomes, so it would otherwise be considered single family attached. However, they're renting those townhomes, so it qualifies as multifamily. 325 total units across the entire property, which is uh, uh, 28 acres for the, uh, the residential portion of it. It comes out to, I think it was like 13 and a half units per acre, somewhere around there. Maybe it was 17, in the teens. Um, and a maximum of three stories, so all the buildings uh, of all sorts, office, uh, retail, and multifamily are gonna be between one and three stories. Uh, there were 17 indications of support and zero in opposition. Uh, I made the motion to approve this. Uh, because, and I, as I stated, my hope is that even though it's not in the same scope and scale as the Collin Creek development, um, I'm hoping that the Collin Creek development and this uh, Plano Market Square Mall update can serve as bookends for the revitalization of the 75 corridor. Now, all I, as I also stated, we have a density issue in Plano, and we have a comparatively extremely high proportion of multifamily housing in the city. So I've said consistently uh, ever since I started campaigning that if we're to add additional multifamily, it needs to make a lot, a whole lot of sense for that area. And I very much believe this does for this area and props to the developer for um, conceiving a great project. It's uh, comparatively, it's only moderately dense. They're not trying to uh, take advantage or go gung ho. Uh, it really is a great project. <laughs> And that passed seven to zero, obviously. Uh, then we moved on to the second public hearing for the bond referendum, uh, which is scheduled to take place next May 1st in the municipal elections. The, the next public hearing will be on January 11th, so you can tune in for that. Um, <clears throat> the current total of proposed projects is $404 million. Um, now, in the absence of any other adjustments, the current, um, the current forecast is that to be uh, tax neutral, meaning require no tax increases. Of course, if all the bonds were denied, then your taxes would go down. But uh, to avoid a tax increase, our break even point is currently 136 million. Um, that's that's um, about a third of the entire proposed package. 
So we're really gonna have to strike a balance between what needs to be done and what kind of tax burden um, are the people willing to bear. So I wanna be perfectly clear, whatever council authorizes to be put on the bond referendum, uh, that will be one set of expenses, but the taxpayers have to vote on it. Now, any bond is paid 100% by the taxpayers. Whatever happens to your actual tax rate or the amount of taxes you're paying in any given year, you're still on the hook for the entire thing. So you get, we have to determine and you have to determine whether those expenses are worth it. The reality is that our city was built out in bursts a couple, two, three decades ago. And a lot of it, mo the, the lion's share, uh, like three fifths of the whole thing is just streets of that 404 million, just streets. Um, so a lot of our streets have a lifespan of 30 years. And guess what? It's been about 30 years and you can tell when you're driving on some of those roads. So as I like to say, our warranty's up. So that's what's at stake. And I've got an article in my blog, just search up bond referendum, and you can read what I wrote about uh, the bond process, how municipal bonds work and what the purpose they serve. Uh, we then moved on to the Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report, to, which is required that we show what we're doing with HUD money. A um, couple of highlights, uh, 24 homeowners were helped with housing rehabilitation and 440 people were helped with homelessness prevention. Uh, a big chunk of that is because of what happened in 2020 and the needs of many uh, were elevated. Uh, more than ever before. And so we did reshuffle some money earlier in the year to enable um, a greater help to those in need uh, because they weren't able to pay their rent or their mortgage. Um, so that's all for tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, Thursday at five o'clock, we're going to have the special city council meeting uh, regarding the Colin Care, or the, uh, the CARES Act funding through, through Colin Cares. Thank you. And uh, even though I'm gonna do a recap after that, I still wish you a very Merry Christmas.